All righty. Good evening, y'all. It's great to see y'all here again. It's been a, it's been a minute, um, but that's okay. So I had uh, a few days ago, they asked me to cover the lesson for tonight. So here I am. I was trying to get the computer set up to where I could see the PowerPoint on this laptop. For some reason, it's not showing. So I'm going to have to keep looking back and forth just to make sure we're on the right slide and right section. So hopefully I don't get whiplash looking back and forth. Um, but anyways, let's go ahead and get started. So tonight, as it states up there, I'm going to be talking about Paul's defense of the ministry. We're going to be focusing on Acts chapter 26. So if y'all want to turn your Bibles there, uh, we're going to do it the way I've usually been doing it. Basically, we go through the, uh, we go through the chapter, we talk about the important, uh, the important points throughout the chapter, and then at the end we get the gleanings from the text. I think it's a very straightforward way of being able to uh, go through the Bible chapter by chapter. And, you know, with tonight being a Bible study, um, you know, it's, it's best that we just try to look at the Bible itself and, and take out what we can from it and see what it tells us. So yeah, if y'all want to turn with me to chapter 26, real quick, I'm just going to give a bit of context. I know most of us have read through the book of Acts. I already have a pretty good idea. Um, okay, good. Uh, but just, just a few things, just so we know where everything's at, uh, who are the characters, what's, what's being set in motion, and so forth. So first off, um, in this chapter, Paul is meeting with King Agrippa. Uh, Agrippa was the king of, of Judea, I guess you would call it, at the time. Um, this was about 60 AD, so this was, you know, obviously into the, into the time of the New Testament. The church had been around for about 25 to 30 years at this point. Jesus, um, historians believe Jesus was, uh, had died around any time from, I believe, 30 to 33 AD. So with uh, Paul meeting Agrippa at about 60 AD, that gives us about 25 to 30 years of how long the, the early church had been around. Um, the early church was very, was very zealous, uh, was, 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 was very um, fervorous. I don't know if that would be the right word. Um, but, you know, many, the, the Christians at the time were very fired up. You know, uh, many of them had met Jesus, had spoken with him. Um, you know, so, so they had a, a, a high level of enthusiasm that, that unfortunately we don't see anymore. And as a result, even within the, that short 25 to 30 year time span, you know, the church had spread out through all of Israel, through, through most of the Roman Empire. You know, everyone was familiar with the way. Uh, one, of the big, one of the big obstacles that the early church had to deal with was um, there was persecution from the Romans and other Gentiles and such, but one of the biggest obstacles was actually uh, many, of the, many of the zealous Jews at the time. Uh, there were many Jewish people uh, you know, who did convert to Christianity, who recognized you know, that Christianity was a step forward, um, you know, that the Old Testament was now gone, and that the New Testament was to be set in place. Um, but there were many, uh, many people, namely those in power like the, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, um, who they, they were very stubborn in their beliefs, and as a result, you know, they, they tended to, uh, they tend to have a lot of conflicts with the early Christians. Um, and even within the church, there was a lot of conflicts uh, between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians about how things should be dealt with, uh, which Paul actually ta talks a lot about in his other books, which we won't get to today. Uh, maybe another time, though. Um, specifically at this point in Acts 21, uh, Paul had returned to Jerusalem. He had been on multiple mission trips. He returned to Jerusalem and he got into conflict with the Jews and they placed him in prison. And then he, um, he, was, put in, uh, he was held prisoner by Governor Felix and later Governor Festus. Uh, they had, of course, worked with the Romans. And they, they, were, un they were uncertain of what to do with Paul uh, because they didn't really see he did anything wrong. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, those that had authority in, in, in Jerusalem and, and the Israeli land, you know, they, they believed Paul to be a blasphemer. They believed him to be evil. They wanted to kill him. If you read the previous chapters before 26, um, it talks about how the Jews, um, you know, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees and such, how they were looking to find a way to kill Paul. You know, they wanted to, to find a way just to get rid of him because, because they hated him so much because of what he preached. Um, the governor, you know, uh, they, they didn't really think Paul was, uh, was guilty, but at the same time, the, uh, Festus, Felix first and later Festus, they didn't want to cause any issues uh, with the Jewish authorities, so as a result, they just held him prisoner and such. Finally, though, Paul recognized, you know, his life was in danger being in Jerusalem, so he decided that since he had the, since he was a Roman citizen, he decided that he wanted to appeal his case to Caesar himself to be able to go all the way to Rome and speak with Caesar and speak with the tribunal over there. Okay, there. Um, and, and as a result, you know, that was what was going to be planned. But then King Agrippa, who was king of the land at the time, the, the Israeli area, um, he wished to hear this case right before Paul left. So Paul, you know, he recognizes, okay, I have to make my defense of why I'm being held prisoner, what's exactly going on. So not only does Paul do that, which is what we're going to talk about in this chapter, 
uh, but he also recognizes I have a moment to preach the word of God to King Agrippa before I go. And that's what we're going to be getting into right now. So if y'all, uh, hopefully y'all already there, we're going to be reading the first uh, section from verses 1 through 11 as it begins. So Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I'm going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, uh, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known to all the Jews. They have known for a long time. If they are willing to testify that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope I am accused by Jews, O King. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I myself was convinced I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, I, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they, when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in all the synagogues, and I tried to make them blaspheme in raging fury against, and in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So here Paul begins to describe his personal life before he met Jesus. You know, many of us, we have our own testimonies. Some of us grew up in the church. Some of us uh, grew up but then departed. Um, but we all have our, our, our accounts on how we came to meet Jesus, how, uh, what, how our lives were before we came across Jesus. And here this is what Paul is doing, um, that the life he lived before accepting Jesus, you know, before becoming baptized, his life as Saul the Pharisee about what he did and the great evils that he did opposing the church and oppo uh, opposing Christ's will. Uh, one thing he also does is he introduces himself uh, and he recognizes Agrippa's Jewish heritage. You know, Agrippa was the uh, king of the Jews in the same way Herod was a few decades before. Um, I put right there as a reference. Um, when, when we read through this, we're going to see one of the things that Paul do, has done multiple times is he recognizes who his audience is. And that's, that's something that we always need to recognize, too. You know, Paul, he's obviously making a defense for who he is and why he's, you know, a prisoner, but he's also trying to preach to Agrippa at the same time. So in his preaching, he recognizes Agrippa knows about our Jewish customs. Uh, you know, he is, he is a Jew like I once was. You know, let me, let me explain to, uh, to him everything in this manner. I put Acts 17 there. Um, because a few chapters before this, a uh, few years before in Paul's life, uh, he was preaching to many Gentiles, you know, the, uh, specifically in Athens in Acts 17. Uh, the Gentiles in Athens, you know, they, were un they had little to no idea of any Jewish customs, so when he preached in Acts 17, he preached uh, quite differently compared to how he's going to preach in this chapter, uh, because the Gentiles in Acts 17, they were unaware of the Jewish customs, they were unaware of the Jewish laws, whereas Agrippa at least has a decent idea of it. Um, so that's, that's just a small thing that I wanted to point out, that whenever we, uh, whenever we preach with someone or study with someone, we have to recognize where they're at first. That's something that I've had to learn recently. Um, I've been studying with a young man on the Spanish side named Raymond, um, and one of the things in studying with him, you know, I first have to learn where is he at um, with the Bible, you know, uh, what, does he believe in God, and so forth, and then I take it from there. And that's something that Paul uh, does in Acts chapter 2. That's something that Peter did at the day of Pentecost. And that's something that we all need to do whenever we preach, uh, whenever we preach the word of God to someone or even, or even just sit down and have a Bible study. First, recognize where they're at and then go from there. And like I mentioned, you know, he recalls his time as a Pharisee and how he used to live, how he lived a life uh, that was against God. You know, at, at first, you know, before uh, Jesus, before Jesus left the earth, you know, he, he did have a, a good conscience, you know, wanting to serve God, wanting to do what was right, but he just was pointing in the wrong direction. Um, and in verses 6 through 8, Paul specifically mentions how this ministry that he's, that he's now doing uh, after leaving the Pharisees, after becoming a Christian, it's not something that's uh, necessarily against the Jewish beliefs, but rather it's a fulfillment of the Jewish beliefs. Uh, he, he wants Agrippa to understand that, you know, that the Jewish belief is that one day there was going to be something greater than the Jewish law, and that was Jesus, and, and he wants him to recognize that. If you reread verses 6 through 8, he talks a bit about that. Yeah, we're going to continue on. If y'all want to turn with me, uh, or just continue with me to verse 12, Paul continues and tells a bit more of his conversion story. So as it reads in verse 12, 
In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes, so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Verse 19. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly visions, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying, both small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets of, what the prophets and Moses would have come to pass, said would come to pass, that Christ must suffer, and that being the first to rise from the dead, he would perform he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. So here, um, Paul continues to tell his story of what caused his big turning point. Um, for him, it was this great miraculous thing that in his quest, you know, to, to work with the Pharisees in what he believed he was doing right, you know, going against uh, the early church because he believed, you know, they were, they were blasphemous, they were evil. Uh, you know, he went to, uh, he went to, Damascus, you know, to, to continue his efforts, and Jesus appeared before him, you know, to, to tell him, to tell him what he was doing was wrong, and we know the rest of, of uh, Paul's story. Paul talks about it here very concisely, very to the point about, uh, basically, he summarizes his, the past, what, 15, 20 years of his life in two minutes here, as we can see, um, and, and he wants to, to let Agrippa know that the work that he is doing is directly from the Lord himself, and that that's, that's Paul's purpose in life now, is to serve the Lord. And that's something that we all need to recognize, too, that when we become Christians, like Paul did on the road to Damascus, uh, when he was baptized, God told him, your purpose is now to serve me. And we need to recognize that, too, as Christians, that now, you know, when we become baptized, that our purpose is now to serve him. It's not to serve our own personal desires, but rather to serve him. Another thing we see is he follows up on where the ministry took him, um, and like it mentions in verse 19, uh, he tells him, you know, he, that he did not want to be disobedient to the Lord. Uh, he wanted to, uh, as it states specifically, that he did not want to be disobedient to the heavenly visions. And, um, and as a result, as it mentions in verses 21 through 23, Paul's ministry eventually caused a conflict with the Jewish authorities. Remember, before, uh, before he converted, Paul was, was highly respected among the Pharisees. You know, he was considered a top rank official, you know, their, their enforcer in many ways, on how he went to persecute the church, how he was zealous for them. So when all of a sudden they hear that their top enforcer is now working with, their, uh, is now working with the enemies, with, with the church, you know, and now he's, uh, he's the enforcer of the church, not the Pharisees, you know, he became public enemy number one for the Pharisees. They wanted to get rid of him uh, as best they could. And as a result, you know, Paul's, Paul's missionary trips, all his work that he did for, for the church, he was always in peril. He was always in danger, uh, whether it be from Gentiles who opposed, uh, who opposed his, uh, his preaching or from the Pharisees who wanted to get rid of him. And one of the big, and there was a multitude of reasons as for why the Pharisees um, were, were very, were very fervent against, against Christianity, against what, uh, what Paul was telling them. Uh, one, of the, one of the things was because there was a level of power, a level, a level of authority that they had, you know, being the top, uh, the top people in the land of Israel as, as the Pharisees, you know, as this, as this political power. And if, they, um, if, the, if the modern church was right, or if the, if the new church was right, you know, they would lose that political power. Um, but not only that, you know, there was a, what is it? Um, there was a sense of pride, you know, this is what they grew up with. They didn't want to change from their beliefs. And, and as a result, you know, they became, they, they got into major conflict with, with, the, with the first church. Um, there's a multitude of reasons why, but that's just a couple. And of course, that caused them to, uh, 
to have conflict with Paul and many other Christians of the time. And then, all right, we'll go ahead and read the final section, um, which is the reaction to Paul's message, uh, verses 24 through 32, as it reads. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your, uh, is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things have escaped his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, In a short time would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, Whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but all who hear me this day might become such as, as I am, except for these chains. Then the king rose, and the governor and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So here we, uh, we get the reaction. You know, Paul gave his, he gave his short speech, his, his short sermon. You know, he had probably five minutes uh, to speak to, to King Agrippa, to speak to Governor Festus, and he poured his heart out. He, uh, he wanted to be as honest with them, as straightforward with them, uh, to the point, you know, hoping that they would understand where he's coming from and maybe even converting. We see, however, though, Festus just outright rejects it. He believes, uh, you know, while he thinks Paul is innocent, he, he thinks Paul is just too crazy. Um, you know, he's thinking this man, you know, he, uh, he was super zealous this way, and then he went into the desert, and now he's super zealous the complete opposite way. I want nothing to do with this. Festus was, was a man who, um, unfortunately, we see commonly uh, nowadays, too, uh, who was, was too much caught up in himself, you know, not wanting to see uh, that Paul was actually speaking the truth, um, and instead, you know, wanted to focus on his own life. If you read a bit earlier, when I was uh, reading this, uh, preparing, one of the things about Festus was, you know, he didn't want to, uh, he was very worried about his reputation with the Jewish people, so he, uh, he was worried about what to do with Paul, bec because he recognized Paul was innocent, but because, you know, he was caring about himself, he worried, if I just free Paul, um, and, you know, and try to protect him, which would be the right thing to do, I would lose my influence with the Jewish people, you know, I could, my political career could be in danger, so we see Festus as someone that is, um, is a very selfish person, isn't someone who's necessarily receptive to the word at this time, at the very least. Agrippa is more of an interesting character, in my opinion. While he does initially dismiss the message, we see the way he dismisses it is very different from Festus. Festus immediately, uh, you know, rejects whatever Paul is saying and thinks he's crazy, you know, says he wants nothing to do with it. The way Agrippa deals with it, what's kind of interesting if you read the, uh, the other translations, and I, I, this is always kind of uh, interesting, I'll get into it right now, but, um, but he ends up essentially telling uh, Paul, not right now, um, you know, like, like, I can't be convinced so easily. Um, and Paul recognizes that Agrippa is slowly, um, slowly starting to understand it. Uh, if we reread again verse, verses 26 through 27, for the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things have escaped his notice. These are uh, everything that occurred with, with Jesus and his death and, you know, the, the, the rise of the church as a result, you know, this is stuff that all the politicians, especially in Israel, knew about even throughout the Roman land because of how fast uh, the, the early church was spreading. So, so Agrippa already had a clear understanding, and, you know, Agrippa knew the old scriptures as he was, uh, as he was raised Jewish, and Paul, you know, confronts him about it. Do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. You know, there's this level of understanding that um, Agrippa might not be like his uh, like his ancestor Herod. Uh, Herod, during the time of Jesus, you know, he outright rejected Jesus. He wanted nothing to do with him. You know, he was very prideful because he considered himself king of the Jews. And yet Agrippa here, there's a level of, of him slowly starting to understand what Paul is getting at. But whether it be due to pride or hesitation, whatever it is, Agrippa decides not not to, to immediately accept Paul at this moment. Um, and yet, Paul tells him, you know, one day I wish that you do accept it, whether it's in a short period of time or in a long period of time. I actually do want to focus on these verses here. Uh, 20, where was it? It's 20, 27 and 28. 
or no, no, I'm sorry, 28 and 29. Um, I don't know if y'all have read these verses in a couple different translations. It's v- they're, they're very different, because like I have here in verse, in the ES, this is, I read from the English Standard Version, uh, Agrippa's reply is, Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And if you read in yours, I think New King James Version says it as, um, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. And then NIV, I don't know if anyone has that one, it says, do you think in such a short time you would persuade me to become a Christian? So that has always confused me for years, so I looked into it. Um, and what's actually really fascinating is the Greek from this part is, uh, it's, it's, it's different, because the way Greek works is different from how English works. So uh, whenever it comes to translating, it's not always going to be a one-to-one, just because the way uh, the Greek language works, especially ancient Greek at this time, works very differently from how we understand English works today. Um, so just to nerd out a little bit about that, uh, that the way, the way it's written in this part here, uh, when Paul and Agrippa are speaking with one another, uh, Agrippa's r- reply to Paul, when Paul asks him, you know, like, do you believe, do you accept what, what I'm telling you, Agrippa, it's implied that he's responding with a question, um, and the way, the way that he's responding, it comes across as if he's saying, uh, in, like, do you believe I, I will respond in a short period of time? So it's more accurate for him to say it uh, as it is in like the, in the NIV version or the English Standard Version. Um, but that's not to say that the version from the New King James is necessarily outright wrong because the intention is still there. Um, the, the implication of, of, uh, of Agrippa's response is still, is still the same in both the ESV and NIV version compared to the New King James version. And that being that, you know, that he has a hesitation. You know, there's, there's part of his heart that does believe Paul, that does want to do what's right, but he's hesitant, whether it be because, you know, he recognizes that there would have to be a lot of changes to his life. Um, maybe he recognizes their sin, their sin that he has in his life, you know, and it, it's, it's also just, you know, I just, uh, sometimes I think we're just hesitant as, as people, you know, when someone tells us to make a big change, especially something like, you know, following the word of God, that's not something that all of us will immediately accept in one day. Some of us will, and that's fantastic, but for some people it does take time. So that's what, uh, that's what we see Agrippa uh, has here. He, dismiss, he dismisses what Paul is telling him, but it's not an outright rejection. And for all we know, maybe Agrippa did one day accept it. Uh, we don't know, the, at least I don't know the rest of uh, King Agrippa's story, but at the very least, you know, I'm a, I want to be in the same boat as Paul, you know, just hoping for the best and praying for him and, and hoping that one day maybe he did. And so that's, that was my, like, nerding out. And also, when I first read this chapter years ago, um, if I don't know if, if y'all want to, I'm going to reread again verse 29. It's, it's a little weird how it says it in the ESV, um, but the, the way that Paul ends off when he says, he basically tells uh, Agrippa and all the people who are listening, he tells them, you know, I, whether, whether it be a short period of time or a long period of time, I wish for all of y'all to be like me, a Christian, except for these chains. So I kind of think it's, he kind of did a bit, if you reread verse 29, he does a little bit of a self-deprecating humor, you know, because he's in chains at that moment. And he wants them to be like him, but just not with the chains. Um, if you read it again, you, you'll, you'll see his kind of like little jest at that moment. I've, I've, always, uh, I've always remembered that. I remember the first time reading that, that verse. Um, but yeah, so that concludes that. And we see here at the end that Paul, is, is, uh, he's approved for his, his request to be sent to Caesar so that he can plead his case with him. Um, and we do see here that Agrippa does believe uh, Paul is innocent. He could have simply, uh, if... If Agrippa chose to outright reject Paul, he could, have ch- uh, he could have claimed that Paul was actually not innocent and tried to find a way to get rid of him. But because, we, uh, because at the end of verse 32, we see Agrippa recognizes Paul's innocence and says he would have been free had he not appealed to Caesar, at least in my opinion, I believe you know, that there's, there's that level of, of uh, that seed was planted in Agrippa, I think is the best way to say it. You know, that, that he's showing a level of mercy to Paul, you know, and that he wants to be able to free him. But because Paul's request was to go uh, all the way to Caesar, you know, he's going to grant that over freeing him. And that concludes the chapter. Um, so right now I do want to go over a few gleanings from the text. Uh, there's only a few. If there's anything anyone uh, wishes to point out from this chapter um, that I don't point out here, uh, by all means, uh, raise your hand and let me know. Uh, the first thing, the, the, big, the big thing from this chapter is Paul's behavior in defending himself. Um, so 
to put Paul into context again, the past five chapters, he's been dealing with, you know, constantly trying to defend himself with, uh, if you start from uh, chapter 21, Paul is defending himself against the Jewish people, he's defending himself against Felix, against Festus, and now he's defending himself against King Agrippa. He's been in prison for at least a few years at this point, I think like two or three years, you know, dealing with all this persecution from just returning back to Jerusalem in, in, uh, in chapter 21. So any other person probably would have been a bit more, would have been frustrated to say the least. And yet Paul, in having this opportunity to be able to preach to Agrippa, you know, we see that he doesn't have any frustration. Instead, he has nothing but love and honesty and wanting to do what's right, recognizing the blessing that he has in being able to preach to, uh, to someone like King Agrippa. So he shows humility and respect in verse 2, the way he addresses King Agrippa. You know, he, he tells him, you know, I recognize your authority, um, and I, I, I recognize that you are a Jewish person like I once was. In verse 25, after Festus calls him crazy, you know, he, he replies to Festus, I am certainly not crazy, most excellent Festus. You know, even when someone insults him to his face, you know, he doesn't choose to insult them back. He still chooses to compliment them. Um, I wish I wrote it here, but uh, Jesus in, um, on the Sermon on the Mount, when he talks about when someone slaps you on one cheek, you know, to turn your, uh, to turn your other cheek, that's essentially what Paul is doing in verse 25. Instead of choosing to, uh, to fight back against Festus, you know, to insult him back, he chooses to still show respect to Festus as he recognizes his level of authority. Uh, Paul is doing this, you know, while defending himself. We also see that Paul is elaborate, yet he's precise. You know, we could have, he could have told his, he's telling his whole life story in this, in this one sermon that he's preaching to, uh, to Festus and Agrippa, and he could have gone on for two, three, four chapters, you know, I mean, we have all the chapters of, of what his life was before this, and yet he decided to be very straightforward and to the point, you know, recognizing I've got five, ten minutes to speak with the group and Festus. Let me preach the word of God to them. Uh, let me tell them my story and let, let me have them understand where I'm coming from. We also see um, that Paul has a level of confidence, um, not in himself, but through Christ. Um, in verse 25, I'll go and reread that. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I'm speaking true and rational words. Um, he's confident in what he's saying is true, is, is correct. You know, sometimes, uh, sometimes I'll be in situations where I'll, you know, I think any of us will say like, well, I don't know. I'm not a hundred percent certain. Maybe it's like this, maybe it's like that. But when it comes to our faith, like Paul, we have to be certain. We have to be certain that there is a true God, that that God is the God of the Bible and that he has a way for us to be saved. And it's through Jesus, um, and we need to recognize that level of confidence that Paul has and be able to display that to others and not be meek and not be uncertain. When someone asks why we believe uh, what we believe and we say, oh, I don't know, it's what I grew up with. Oh, that's just like my opinion, you know? That's, that's not how we should be react, reacting when it comes to our faith. Uh, there's a few verses that talk about this, but I put Romans 15, 17, uh, Paul speaking, in Christ Jesus then I have reason to be proud of my work for God. We often talk about pride in a negative manner, and most of the time it is, but when we have pride in the Lord, that, that's nothing but a, a great thing for us to have. You know, we can be confident that we can boast in the Lord, uh, that we can be confident that the Lord has saved us through Jesus, and that's the type of confidence, uh, the type of pride that Paul has, and that's something that we should strive to have too, a confidence in the Lord, not in ourselves, but in the Lord and what he can do for us and what he can do for others. And the last, uh, the last point about Paul's behavior is his care and love for the lost. Um, you know, in, uh, after giving his heart out, you know, being in prison for, for a multitude of years, recognizing he's got a few minutes to preach the word of God to Agrippa and to Festus, and they both choose to reject him at this time. You know, instead of, instead of cursing them, instead of getting mad at them, he simply tells them, uh, you know, I hope one day y'all believe what I preach to you, you know, I hope that I have planted the, uh, the seeds in your hearts. So he shows a level of care and a level of love to them um, that we need to imitate too. Sometimes people are going to reject us uh, for what we teach them, for what we preach to them, and we still have to show them that we care about them, and we still have to show them that we love them. And then a, a couple last gleanings before we finish up, so it's going to be a little shorter today. One thing um, that this chapter shows us is that anyone can be saved. Um, a few years back, I remember a brother at PTP, he gave a lesson uh, 
about Paul and one of the pivotal reasons why, Jesus, why God chose Paul to be you know, the, the one who would preach to the Gentiles, who would do uh, the work that he did, was because of Paul's past. Um, Paul talks about it in verses 9 through 11, how before he chose to follow God, or, or before Paul chose to, uh, to follow Jesus and, and God, um, you know, the way that he, was, that he was leading his life was, like, so diametrically opposed to how God expected, um, you know, how it specifically, I'll just reread it, just the way how he talks about it, and, and that we recognize what he did was evil before he met Jesus. This is Paul speaking, verse 9. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests. So one, we see that he locked up, uh, you know, Christians, people who were following Jesus. That, that's one thing he did. Um, verse, oh, right there, uh, from the chief priests. But when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. You know, he didn't necessarily outright kill them, but, but he approved of their deaths. So we read that if you go back to Acts 7 or Acts 7 or Acts 8 uh, with the death of, of Philip, no, Stephen, I'm sorry, uh, with the death of Stephen, how it talks about at the end of that chapter uh, how Paul had approved of, of Stephen's death, you know, how he viewed it, it was, it was a good thing, but also reading verse 11, and I punished them often in, the, in all of the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. We read there how in verse 11, Paul went so far as to try to force them to say blasphemous things, to, to deny God, essentially, you know, trying to, to torture them to the point, torture is probably the best word, to torture them to the point to renounce their religion, to renounce uh, their Christianity, their faith. Um, that's how evil what Paul was doing was, you know, not only was he taking the lives of Christians, he was trying to coerce Christians into denying their eternal salvation, into, um, into rejecting Jesus himself. It's one thing for someone to be mean to you because you're a Christian. It's another thing for someone to do everything in their power to get you to no longer follow Christ. And that's, that's something we need to recognize about how, quite frankly, evil Saul was, how much he was opposed to the Lord. And yet, even though he did all those things, Paul, God still chose him. God still uh, used Jesus or through, through Jesus, you know, he approached him on the road to Damascus and told Saul, I have work for you. I need you to work for me. I know you have been opposed to me. Um, you have been opposed, uh, opposed to my son, but, but I have work for you. And Paul recognized that. He repented of his sins, and he chose to follow the Lord. And nowadays, we can look to Paul, and we can, we can learn so much from him. You know, half of the New Testament was written by him, um, so that's one thing that this chapter reminds us, is that anyone can be saved. Anyone, even someone as evil as, as Paul once was before his conversion. And I also put right here, um, politicians such as Festus or Agrippa. I know, you know, I don't want to get all political, but I don't think many of us like most of our politicians. Um, but we also have to recognize that those politicians are still lost souls that need to be saved. And granted, I probably am not ever in my life going to have a chance to speak five, ten minutes with whoever the president is. But you know, I'll still have opportunities in my life to speak with people who have a level of influence. Um, and if I can, you know, I need to recognize that I should take advantage of those opportunities and try to preach to them and try to speak with them, if possible, about the, about the Lord, about the Bible. And many of them will choose to, to reject us, you know. There'll be many politicians or many other powerful people like Festus who will call us crazy, who will just outright reject us. But then there will be others like Agrippa who will say, hey, maybe you got a point but maybe not right now. For those people, we need to pray for, for any of those kind of people. Um, I put politicians there, but it, it doesn't matter who. We need to recognize that anyone can be saved, even people um, as evil as some of our corrupt politicians or as evil as, as, as Saul once was. The final point that I have here is, uh, it's a bit encompassing this, this final section of Acts. Uh, I put journey, not the destination. In Acts 20, in Acts 20, right before uh, Paul is returning to Jerusalem, he meets with the elders of, of Ephesus, and before, and he like says his goodbyes with them, and they warn him and essentially tell him, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to die. They, they received, I think, like gifts, visions that like, you know, Paul was going to suffer a lot if he went back to Jerusalem. So they were trying to tell him, don't go back, don't go back, because um, they were worried about him. You know, they loved him as a, as a brother in Christ. You know, he helped uh, build up the church in Ephesus, so they are worried about him. And Paul tells them, you know, 
whatever happens to me happens if I go back to Jerusalem. Regardless, I'm going to choose to serve the Lord. I put 25 there, but I really should have put 21 because of all the events that occurred from 21 all the way to 28. Um, his, his final mission, the final mission trip of Paul essentially starts there when he gets arrested by the Jews, uh, when he's put in prison by uh, Festus, uh, by Felix first and then later Festus. Um, Paul makes his, makes his decree that he wishes to appeal to Caesar, and ultimately the reason why is because if he gets to uh, appeal his case to Caesar, he has a chance to preach to Caesar and possibly even convert him. But Paul recognizes, you know, that along the way, I'm going to be meeting with so many different types of people, and I'm going to be able to preach to them. I'm going to be able to speak to them about the Word of God. In chapter 26, Paul had the chance to be able to speak with uh, King Agrippa, which is what we read today. Um, but if you read later on in 27 and 28, it talks about uh, the different other people he met on his trip to Rome, you know, when his ship crashed, and how he was able to preach uh, to the other prisoners who were on the ship with him, um, had, how he had a chance to show the people who were on the island of, was it Crete or Cyprus? I don't remember, wherever, wherever they crash landed, how he had a chance to be able to preach to those people too. When he got to Rome, before he was able to meet Caesar, you know, he was able to preach to other people uh, within the city, um, how he had a, he was confined like a house arrest uh, while he lived in Rome. And even then, it talk, at, the end of, at the end of Acts, it talks about how he essentially set up a, a little church there and people would come to visit him and he would preach to them, talk to them about the word of God. And Paul recognized, you know, yeah, his goal was to speak with Caesar, you know, one, to appeal his case, but two, to preach to Caesar, but also that along the way he could keep preaching to others, anyone that he encountered, anyone that had an open heart. And I think that's a great place to end it off and just to remind us that, you know, we may have a, a destination of where we see ourselves in five, ten years. For Paul, you know, his destination on earth was to get to Caesar so he could preach to Caesar. But along the way, he recognized that he could still do his best to preach to souls that were lost and hopefully be able to try to save them. And that's something that, that we similarly should recognize, too. It's not going to be easy. Sometimes people are going to reject us. They're going to call us crazy like Festus called, um, called Paul crazy. But all we can do is just pray for them and just hope for the best and just keep preaching the word of God. Uh, with that, I conclude my lesson. Uh, was there any questions, any corrections? I know in case I said anything wrong. No? All righty. Well, I thank you all for, for your time here. Uh, let's end off things with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven.